Uh, hello there, everybody. Welcome to this week's edition of The Verdict, which will concentrate solely on Kipco British Champions Day that took place at Ascot on Saturday. It was said by many uh, prior to the meeting that this was looking to be the best ever Champions Day. Well, that uh, tends to be said about most sporting events uh, these days. Was it the best ever? Well, it's hard to say. It depends what criteria you apply. It certainly was a brilliant day's racing and we saw some fantastic performances. One general point before we get into the opening contest, and that's about the ground. It was on the easy side officially, but the times of the first two races suggested that it was just good ground that they raced on, perhaps a little easier on the round course than on the straight course. But the times didn't improve thereafter, and nor were they in line really with the first two times. And I think the track must have deteriorated throughout the day, not because they had any rain, because they didn't, it stayed dry, but because the ground became cut up and the horses running in the latter races were not getting the purchase that the ones in the opening races did, and they were not getting much help from the ground either. We start with the stayers. This was a fantastic renewal. Trushan was in there, Stradivarius, Hamish on the back of his Winning return at uh, Kempton off a layoff. Baron Samdi, the Mediterranean there as well for Aidan O'Brien. What a fantastic renewal, just shy of two miles. So let's send them on their way in what turns out to be a messy and controversial contest. Trushan wins from Takshan and back in third place, Stradivarius. Most of the controversy surrounds Stradivarius. He's in the yellow cap, carrying his head to one side as he tends to do. And the point about the early stages of this race was that it was really quite steadily run. And there's a problem when we come to the first bend and it's caused by the Mediterranean. It was ridden by Ryan Moore and he's just there, just edging to the front at that point. Ryan's a few, few horse widths off the rail, but once he gets to the bend, he's gonna do what people do in, in cycling and athletics as well. He's going to cut in towards the rail to go the shortest way round, and that causes trouble in behind. And Stradivarius is one of the sufferers. Trushan, quite keen, blue and white, blue and yellow colours in behind. There's Ryan cutting across, and he caught, hampers a number of horses against the rail, and Stradivarius there loses momentum and position. There he is quite a long way back. And that did not do him any favours whatsoever. Although at the time he was quite far back and he was quite wide anyway. The pace down the back here was pretty steady. They didn't pick it up until well after halfway. The Mediterranean are bowling along. Trushan getting quite keen in behind. He travelled really well. Blue cap of Holly Doyle. And he of course won this race last year. And a time comparison is interesting. Last year, 3 minutes 35.68 on ground described as soft. This year, 5 seconds quicker than that. So we were not dealing with soft ground here whatsoever. We were dealing with ground that was bordering on good, but a race that was steadily run and messy. Now, here comes a problem for Stradivarius. He's too far back, Frankie, in a steadily run affair. He's giving his horse quite a lot to do. And he's thinking to himself, I'm sure at this stage, what am I going to do? When am I going to make a move? How am I going to get into a good position turning for home? And that's going to be a real problem for him. And we'll see in a moment or two that he comes to blows with Baron Samdi and Dylan Brown McMonigal, which didn't please Frankie at all. And it means that Frankie couldn't make up ground that he wanted to. He sat second last there compare him to uh, Trushan who's a lot handier he's just sat in fifth place what is he five six lengths ahead of Frankie de Tori at this stage still quite steady up front look at the winner reefing and pulling with the blue cap he's in fifth place on the outside now de Tori's got a decision to make they're going a bit steady I mean at a positional disadvantage he tries to make a move I think he wants to come up here I think he wants to make a move and get closer to the speed. So he angles out to the outside and he tries to make a move. But Dylan Brown McMonigal was not having any of it. There they are, coming to blows. And he gets a nudge, Stradivarius and Frankie, from Dylan Brown McMonigal, who's trying to hold his ground. He doesn't want Frankie cutting in front of him into here somewhere 
and he's going to then be stuck in behind Stradivarius. He wants to hold his position. So there he goes. He nudges Frankie, who has a little look across. He's clearly not happy. And then he has to drop back in again. And now Stradivarius is in trouble. What can you do from there in a steadily run affair? Trushan's about to go. He gets a nudge from Takshan. It's all getting really messy on the bend. But Trushan's still got four or five lengths on Stradivarius. And way Holly Doyle goes. Now look at the passage Stradivarius has to take now. It really is Buffalo girls go round the outside here for Frankie. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven wide when he comes round. And to be fair to Stradivarius, he's run an absolute blinder really because he's got hampered down the back. He was hampered on that first bend when the Mediterranean came across. He's forced to challenge five wide, yet for a stride or two, it looked like he might just get there. He goes past Hamish, who traveled quite strongly in the race. He's got him beaten. He's gonna go and go and get Takshan beaten now. He's on the far side. You'd think he's got him beat there. One last lunge for Trushan. No, the petrol has gone. He's on empty because of that massive effort round the bend. He's completely on empty. And he can't make any ground on Trushan in the closing stages. Trushan, fantastic performance from this horse. He's won this race two years on the bounce now. He's the new kid on the block in staying contests, providing he gets a little bit of ease in the ground, just a bit of help from the ground. Doesn't need it bottomless at all. He wouldn't want summer fast ground but with a little bit of the ease in the ground, he's a very, very good stayer. Um, Takshan, race of his life. Brilliant run from this horse in second place for the Brian Ellison team. And Stradivarius was just hampered throughout that contest and had little chance of winning how it panned out. Um, the main point to make about Stradivarius really was that he's held up in the slowly run race. And he was at a positional disadvantage. And I know he got hampered a couple of times quite badly. And Frankie wasn't happy about what happened with Dylan Brown McMonigal. But really, he was in a bad position. That was the main problem. So how do we sum this up then? Well, there was no early pace. We saw that. It led to the race getting pretty messy and rough, certainly on the home bend. What else can we say? Final time, just 3.88 seconds above the racing post standard. And I think that suggests it wasn't that bad at all, the ground on the round course. I think they went a steady gallop and they still produced a pretty good time. So I think that's all right. Time comparison. Last year, Trushan, 3.35.68. This year, 3.30.68. There you go. So five seconds between the two years. And they went steady this year. Really clear. Winner clearly doesn't need it bottomless. Absolutely not. I mean, I think people have pegged him as a, just a soft ground performer. Well, he just wants a bit of ease just to help him. Strad, the Strad, held up in a steadily run race was hampered and forced to race very wide, turning for home. And that did for him. I think he'd have gone pretty close. I think he'd have given Trushan a real fight if he hadn't been forced that wide. I think that has implications as to whether they keep him in training as well. They're going to make a decision about Stradivarius in the next few days, but he's clearly all still there, I think. And Tashkala rapidly improving stay. Well done to the Brian Ellison team. Uh, they've got a really nice horse for next season. Well, we said that Dottori wasn't happy. This is how unhappy he was. He says, the kid in front, that's Dylan Brown McMonigal, did everything he could to get me beat. It was a disgrace. Well, did Ryan Moore do everything he could to get him beat as well on the first bend? Was Ryan Moore a disgrace? I don't think so. And I'm not sure that Dylan Brown McMonigal was. Number one, Dylan Brown McMonigal is the best apprentice in Ireland, and he's a very, very, very good jockey and a very savvy jockey. I, I personally think, and it's about opinions, but I think he was just race riding. He was just holding his line. He did give Notori a bit of a nudge, but it wasn't as if he went left hand down and went banged into him. So I think he was just trying to, trying to hold his line. And I think Dottori was just frustrated that things didn't pan out better for Stradivarius, because I think he felt he had a horse under him who could have gone very close. That was the stayers. Second race on Saturday was the Kipka British Champion Sprint Stakes. Six furlongs for this Group 1 and Art Power, who'd run uh, won very well in Ireland last time, up 3-1. to one. Rohan, 5-1. to one. Creative Force, 11-2. to two. Kinross, 13-2. to two. He was a money horse on the day, backed in from 10s. Dragon Symbol, 7s. Uh, Minzar, 16. Same for Vadrim. And last year's winner, Glenshield, was 22-1. to one. So, let's have a look and see how this uh, panned out. And as we look at the... 
the stall numbers, you'll see that it probably was important to be low here. Um, five, two, four, the first three came from, and the fourth horse came from stall 20, Art Power. We'll send them on their way. There's the winner. That was Creative Force. The second was Glen Shiel. Third was Minzal. And fourth, right over this side, Art Power. And you can see from, from looking at that that you can probably infer that Art Power's run a, a blinder of a race. He's run really well. Who was to know where, where he wanted to go? Well, it would appear to me that the jockeys knew, at least most of them knew, most of them that could get across to that far side got across. It'd be very hard for D'Souza and Art Power, the grey horse nearest this side, to have, to have got across. But look at the two groups. Most of them did manage to get across to the far side. And that included the winner. We'll pick him out, the Godolphin Blue. Creative Force. Amazingly, this is Charlie Appleby's first ever runner on Kipco British Champions Day. First runner and first runner is a winner. And a winner for uh, William Buick, which for some briefly ignited the Jockeys Championship with uh, O'Sheen Murphy. That light soon to be put out. But Creative Force likes Ascot. He won the jersey here over seven furlongs and a stiff six really suits him very well indeed. He's got a lovely toe from Holly Doyle and Glenn Shiel. Holly looking to back up Trushan's success and win this race again on Glenn Shiel, who was bouncing back to form at his favourite track on his favoured ground. But Creative Force has got him now and has got him beaten, but he plugs on really well. Look at the Shadwell colours. They had a brilliant day overall. Minzal, he's picking up really well in the closing stages. And towards this side, well, I'll just pick out two horses that you've got to keep a Keep a good eye on going forward next season, sprinting. Um, Art Power, he's run really well given his draw, and so has this. And guess what, that's Kinross. And Frankie had no luck on this horse either. Uh, he was drawn over towards the stand side. He got hampered when he tried to come with his run. Kinross is really going on at the death and has run a blinder. He might be better at seven, but he's still run a, a great race. But it is creative force for the all-conquering Charlie Appleby who wins here. He clearly likes this track and a stiff six uh, just suited him. The time is interesting for it was only 0.89 seconds slower than standard. It just suggesting that the ground really was on the straight course good. His final time 113.79 so that's as I said just 0.89 outside the standard. So for this first race before the ground deteriorated a little bit and you can see it getting cut up that was a good time from Creative Force beating Glenn Scheel and Minzal. Anything in behind that took the eye? Well, we must mention Brando. He's been a grand horse, hasn't he, there in the sheepskin noseband, yellow and blue colours. He has now been retired. Kevin Ryan's done a grand job uh, with him. Yeah, he didn't really run his race, but um, he's run plenty of big races in the past. So we wish him a, a happy retirement. But uh, William Buick getting Creative Force to land the spoils and beat to Glen Shield. The draw definitely played a significant part for this race, which was the first on the straight course. It wasn't so significant when we come to the last, the Balmoral handicap over the straight course, but it certainly was here. Five, two, four, the first three, and the fourth art power ran a blinder from 20. I think most of the jockeys seemed to know that low was best, and those that could get across got across. Fifth career success for Creative Force, and uh, it's his second at Ascot. It's very much a specialist track, this, particularly on the straight course, and he loves it there. Time's important to note, really. 0.89 seconds slower than standard, I think suggesting the ground on the straight course at this point of the day, before any deterioration, was uh, good. 1.13.79, a quick time. I'm giving Art Power massive credit from stall 20. There's no way Sylvester D'Souza could, could get across. He's, uh, easily beaten those horses that he raced with towards the stand side. Let's keep Kinross on side as well. He might be a seven furlong horse. But stick him in your, your racing TV track. He's sort of horse that can sort of slip under the radar a little bit. And um, a strongly run stiff six would be within his compass in this sort of company uh, going forward if he, he stays in training, which I'm pretty sure he will. William Bukes. I know he was only runner-up in the, the Jockeys Championship. But he takes the plaudits of the, the crowd there. He's had a, a fabulous season. And uh, according to his agent, uh, Tony Hind, he'll be all guns blazing for the championship next year.
The third race on Saturday at Ascot was the Kipco British Champions Phillies and Mare Stakes, a group one over a mile and a half. And, uh, Snowfall was back against her own sex, having run in the Prix de de Triumph and run pretty well, and she was 8-11 to 11 to go in again. Alba Flora 3-1, to one. Invite 7-1, to one. Eshada 16s, Tribalcraft 20s and 28s and bigger uh, the rest. Didn't look to be a race of uh, great strength in depth, bar Snowfall, who'd been hugely impressive when she won the Oaks and the Yorkshire Oaks. Um, let's have a look at this race then. The winner uh, was a little bit of a shock. It was Ashada who got the better of Alba Flora, and back in third place was a Snowfall. Let's send them on their way here. There you go, there's the stall numbers for you. Ashada from eight, Alba Flora from six, and Snowfall from stall number three. She proves a real disappointment, Snowfall, and she's a bit tardy out of the gates as well there. She's a little bit slowly into stride. I just wonder whether she's trained off a little bit. Maybe the season's just been a bit long for her. She's been in a few battles. And people have mentioned to me that, well, she hasn't had to, hasn't had to do much all year. She's bolted up at Epsom. She bolted up at, at York. She's won in fast times and she's won easily without having a hard race. But if you run a fast time, whether something pushes you or not, you're still having a hard race. And I, I think she's had a, a pretty hard season and maybe she's just uh, trained off just a little bit. Quite a steady gallop here. They didn't go too mad. La Jaconde and Holly Doyle towards the outside is about to force the issue, presumably for uh, Snowfall. She too trained by uh, Aidan O'Brien. And the final time was 2 minutes 34.05, which is nearly five seconds slower uh, than the Racing Post standard. So looking at the first two times, this is, a, this is a poor time compared to those, and poor time compared to Trushan, who also raced on the round course, the beginning of the deterioration of the track, and that's nothing against the executive at Ascot to do a fantastic job. It's just what happens when you race on slightly easy ground and it just gets cut up, and then horses don't get much purchase or help from it in latter races. Ashada, at this point, is in the Shadwell colours. She's just tucked in behind the leaders there in the striped cap, travelling uh, really strongly, and she's got form all her form is on in softish ground. Well, certainly ground with a bit of cut in it. Uh, she has been beaten on very fast ground. She's won three of her five races and both of her defeats have come uh, when there was firm in the going description. So that we clearly can tell from her form that she wants uh, good ground or just a little bit of a cut in the ground to give her her best. And she got what she wanted here. Um, she's a uh, behind Loving Dream she was uh, last time we saw her. And that form's now been frank, because Loving Dream, you remember, won the pre-Royal Year. And um, that means that the Ribblesdale must be pretty good, Loving Dream winning that from Ashada. So that makes that Ribblesdale look really good now, because there's two Group 1 winners now that have come out of the race. Here's a point I want to look at now. Ashada's about to get to the front, a go away and, uh, and win pretty well. Alba Flora's the grey here. She runs an honest and, and tough race. And here's Snowfall. Well, Ryan Moore's delivered her perfectly. He's had her settled from that tardy start. He can come and challenge now, but she hangs to her right. You'd think she'd win now. You'd think she'd change her legs and fly away, but oh no, look, look at her lugging in behind. She wants to get in behind Snowfall. She wants to get in, in, in sorry, Alba Flora. She wants to get in there. She's hanging and she doesn't find much off the bridle at all. And she's just putting her head to one side too. We know she handles uh, cutting the ground. Her stride is shortening now in the closing stages. Ryan's. Well, he's given up now. He knows he's going to be third. He can't get first or second. So he just pushes her out, punches her out for, for third. But she never looked like winning, did she? She never looked like getting uh, to the front two. They fought out a great duel. Ashada just beating Alba Flora. They're both two really nice fillies, really commendable fillies. And I think they'll stay in training for next season as well, which is uh, great news. But I don't think we saw Snowfall at her best. I really don't. Either the season's too long and she's trained off a little bit, or the hanging right suggested there's something amiss with her, one or the other, or perhaps a little bit of both. So how do we sum the fillies and mares up? Well, the final time of 2.34.05 was 4.95 slower than the racing post standard. So it was quite steadily run, um, but it wasn't a flash time. Next up, this win and that of Loving Dream in the pre royal Year really does frank the Ribblesdale form. Uh, they were one-two in the Ribblesdale and uh, two Group 1 winners have now come out of uh, that race. It's a very, very formful contest from Royal Ascot. Sharda, she's won three of her five races. Uh, both defeats have come with firm in the going description and quite well beaten as well on one occasion. So uh, she really wants ground uh, similar to the, the condition she got on Saturday. 
Snowfall, I think she's trained off. I think she's just had a long season and it's just caught up with her a bit. But she did hang badly right under pressure, which is slightly worrying. Let's hope she's OK. So that was the Phillies Amez. A fantastic finish, a great win for the Roger Varian team and a Shada. Three ten at Ascot on Saturday was a QE2. And uh, I think this was the best race of the meeting by some way. It was over a mile, of course, and Palace Pier was 6-4. to four. Baid was 2-1, to one, The Revenant 13-2, to two, Alcohol Free 10s. And it was 11-1 to one and bigger the rest, which included Ben Battle at 33s and Mother Earth at 33s as well. You've got a, a, a Joel Stakes winner and a Thousand Guineas winner, both trading at 33-1. to one. That tells you just how strong uh, this race was. And Baid was the winner, and he now... He's unbeaten in six. What a revelation he's been this season. Palace Pier was second and Lady Bothorpe was back in third. She ran an absolute blinder. There they are, highlighted for you on the straight course at Ascot. And uh, away they go. It's quite a, a strongly run race, although the first couple of furlongs were relatively steady as jockeys sort of just jostled for position. At this moment, Ben Battle is in front, and the first and second are just looking to drop their heads a bit. He's a bit keen by Eid. There he is. And there's Palace Pier. He's just reefing and pulling under Jim Crowley a bit. Pat Cosgrave going steady on Ben Battle. But after a couple of furlongs, it looks like he, he winds it up. And then the pace builds throughout the contest to provide a time of 142.57 uh, over the mile here, which is 3.67 seconds above standard. I think given the quality of horse on show here they could possibly run a little bit better and later on here on the verdict we'll compare that time to the Balmoral which has run over the straight mile as well at the end of the card. I think Baid can run faster than, than this. Uh, what I do know though that is this is a, a brilliant racehorse. He was highlighted here on the verdict after his debut win at Leicester and he's just gone from strength to strength to strength. Keep an eye on Frankie de Tory. John Gosden was mildly critical of him, constantly looking around, constantly looking through his legs, turning around, having a look. He obviously worried about where, where Baid was, but he had first jump on him really. He's got a length and a bit on him and they're just going an, an honest gallop. Now you can see that Ben Battle's picked it up quite a bit since those first couple of furlongs. Uh, Frankie coming to challenge now. Lady Bothop going well. She's stuck in a bit of a pocket next to Baid. Nowhere to go at this stage. Master of the Seas, the white cap being bustled up by Will Buick. Now Baid goes, and he's got a bright turn of foot, this horse. He picks up really well and gets rid of uh, Palace Pier and a stiff drive from Jim Crowley. I feared that he might empty at this stage because he'd been a bit keen through the first two furlongs, but he was keen off a really steady gallop and he didn't use up much. And he's just got enough to see off Alice Peer, Lady Bothorpe, she got out and then she ran on really well in the closing stages. That's a, a big effort from her. The two out the back, Ben Battle, the pace setter, he wants better ground and Lord Glitters, who was just a little bit uh, disappointing. You see here, Frankie's looking again. Well, he's not behind you, Frankie, he's right next to you. Here he comes on the outside in the, the Shadwell colours. A fabulous um, double for Jim Crowley after a shard of success in the Phillies and Mares, a group one a double and Baye picks up really well. I've got a suspicion, and Jim Crowley, when interviewed afterwards, hinted at this, that Baid will be better when he gets decent ground. I think he wants good ground, maybe even a little bit quicker, and you'll see an even better horse if he does get that. But he's got the job done here, beating uh, Palace Pier and uh, Lady Bothorpe. In behind, no excuses for anything really. Alcohol free struggle for a bit of uh, running room uh, for a while, but got out and didn't really pick up. She does have a turn of foot, but she didn't pick up. Uh, that strongly. The Revenant was a little bit uh, disappointing. He won this race last year. He's been placed in it as well. He's a tad disappointed, but I thought he ran reasonably well for Francis Graffard. He wouldn't be too upset with how he ran, but Baid is just a monster. He's just a superstar. He really is, and he's going to stay in training, which is fantastic news. We'll be able to see him next year, and um, well, I for one really like this horse, and on better ground, I think it'd be more devastating. Final time, 3.67 above the Racing Post standard at 142 at 57. It's an okay time. I think given that in the sprint that track was riding good ground really in the first race on the straight course, they could have gone quicker, but the first two furlongs were just steady. Steadily run then in on those first couple of uh, furlongs. Ben Battle took them along. I think then Pat Cosgrove felt that he ought to just force the issue a bit in a way he went and he built the pace up from there. Jim Crowley seemed to have a definite plan, I thought. He just tracked Palace Pier throughout. Frankie Kept looking for him. He was always there. 
and then eventually he was away and gone. The winner was better here than he was when he won the Moulin last time. I think there is no doubt about that whatsoever. Some people crabbed what he did in the Moulin, thinking that he made real hard work of it and really that's probably just as good as he is. But William Haggis was adamant he didn't have him spot on uh, that day. He had him spot on this time though. What else can we say? Well, the form, it does look rock solid. Uh, a big payday for Lady Bothorpe. What a season she's had. She was third here. Picked up well over 100 grand for finishing in third place and she has now been retired and she should make a, a fabulous broodmare. And finally, Baid will be hard to beat wherever he goes. That uh, goes without saying really. And given his physical appearance, he's a big, strong brute of a horse. He might be an even better four-year-old. Wow, if that is the case, so we've got something very much to look forward to next season. Time for the Kipco Champion Stakes uh, over 10 furlongs. Mishrif was sent off favourite at 13 to 8, but uh, Adiar, Derby winner, was a 5 to 2 second favourite. Dubai Honour was 6 to 1, 8 to 1 a day. Sealyway was 12s and 16s and bigger the rest, including Alasi, uh, Max Sweeney, and, and Jim Goldie throwing Yukon Glen at the piece uh, as well. Um, what a race this was. Sealyway uh, won from Dubai Honour and Max Sweeney. It was a very interesting contest, given that to both Mishriff and Adiar were a bit disappointing. Uh, there they are, highlighted. There's the third, that's uh, Max Sweeney. He's on a blind. He loves cutting the ground. That's why I think he's found himself in third spot uh, in the end. Let's send them on their way then. Um, overall, this was quite a, a quick time, given the conditions. It was 2.91 seconds above uh, the Racing Post standard. So if you compared it with the Shada, this is a, this is a, a much better time. Uh, in the early stages of the race, you've got a Dave on the inside in the, in the yellow colours, Fox's tail. And let's talk um, Adiar, shall we? Here he is towards the outside. William Buick had a, a difficult task. He's had a wide draw to overcome and he had a decision to make and he decided to go forward on this horse and he was just a bit too keen. The winner's in there in behind tracking him. Um, and he just did too much, I think, Adiar. Uh, it's a shame, really, because I thought with a bit of dig, a mile and a quarter here, uh, might suit him. He'd only had 13 days as well to get over his exertions in the Prix de l'Arc de Triomphe, so uh, maybe that took its toll uh, too. I think we shouldn't treat him too harshly on the back of this, but he, he had to work from his outside draw, then he got a bit keen with William, and I think he paid for that in the latter stages uh, of the contest. No excuses for Mishrif though. Um, he was well beaten in this race last year. Here's Mishrif and David Egan, well beaten last year on soft ground. And he, he's quite well beaten this time around as well. He's just a little bit, little bit uh, disappointing. He's had a fairly busy year. Remember, he's been on the go since running in, in Saudi and winning uh, on the dirt out there. So it's been uh, quite a long season for, for him, although he's had some, some quite big gaps between his races uh, as well. The winner's just sat in third place. Mikel Barcelona, the man on uh, Sealy Way. He was a Group 1 winner at two on the Prix uh, Jean-Luc Lagardère on heavy ground, importantly, perhaps over seven furlongs and uh, he's got some pretty good, good form to his name and uh, wasn't unfound in the market either. And he travels up into this contest uh, very strongly indeed. One horse you're gonna have to mark up is Dubai Honor. He finishes in second place. And if you just look at the positions of these horses as we turn into the home straight, Adiar's out in front, Adabe's gonna get tired in second, the winner and Barcelona, there he is. What a position he's got. Just go and attack Adiar. Big target on Adiar's back. He can go and attack him. There's Dubai Honor, taken back from the start. And now, watch what he does under James Doyle. He makes a massive move to go and get into contention and look like Frustride might win the race. But he just pays for that effort of closing that gap highlighted there. And then he just can't really go through in the last 150 yards or so. But he's run an absolute screamer. There you go. He's just coming wide now. He'd been taken back from the start, having been hampered a little bit. And look, he's closing in now. He's going to go past McSweeney. He's now going to come and try and chase Mishrift down, which he'll do. Sealy Way, well, he's got positional advantage over Dubai Honor, who's made up what? If you look at that gap that we highlighted on the home bend, now look how close he's got. He's right there, there, head to head here. Going head to head at the furlong pole. Dubai Honor's made up a, a heap of ground to get into contention. But now, understandably, he's going to pay for it. He's going to get tired. See the way he's drifting into him a little bit. 
and he there just at the line he's going away and he wins a length in the end and it would have been another length if they'd gone another 30 40 yards or so as Dubayona got tired but Sweeney boxing on gamely in the closing stages he loves cutting the ground and he's run a a, a very good race indeed Dubayona on the outside though that was a massive effort a huge effort uh, from this horse and he would have gone very very close if he hadn't been at such a positional disadvantage I think disappointments Al Arzi he's becoming a little bit disappointing in the Shadwell colours he drops away I think Mishrif didn't really give his running I don't think Adiar gave his running either Mishrif's run okay I suppose weakening into a fourth place but well beaten in the end I just wonder if he doesn't want too much dig in the ground Mishrif I know he has one on soft ground in France but just not sure that he that he really wants dig in the ground in in, in a deep group one contest, perhaps that's done for him. There was Dig here last year when he got beat. Adiar just too keen in the early stages. So it fell apart just a little bit. Sealyway, lightly raced this season, relatively fresh compared to the others. It's picked up the pieces and Dubai on as a massive eye catcher. Uh, what he did there on, on some occasions would see him win a, a group one race. It's just that Sealyway had a, a positional advantage. So it was a quick time in the conditions, 2.91 above the racing post standard. What else? Well, solid form. Adia Mishrif perhaps underformed, underperformed a little bit, but it still looks pretty solid. Winner was a Group 1 winning juvenile. A little underestimated in the market, perhaps. Uh, I know some people were, were quite keen on this horse, but I uh, went in eventually at 12 to 1. Mishrif's never won at Ascot in three goes, interestingly, and he was well beaten in this race last year. Is there something in that? Maybe. Adiar too keen, sent forward from his wide draw. I think they had to send him forward, really. It was the right decision, but he was just too keen. And perhaps, you know, Derby, King George, Ark, and then having to come here and, and try and uh, win this was just perhaps a, perhaps a step too far for uh, Adiar. But he's had a, had a brilliant season nonetheless. Dubai Honor deserves an upgrade. We've highlighted why. He was a long way back turning for home. He made up all the ground that he had to and then just had no petrol left in the, in the closing stages. But that was a, a massive effort uh, from him. But... Uh, Sealyway doing what uh, Cyrus Desaigle did, winning the champion stakes. Final race on the card was the Balmoral Handicap, Kipco sponsoring this as well, of course. It was over a mile. Sunray Major was uh, two to one at the head of the market and very, very strong for John Thady Gosden and Frankie de Tori. Aldari, seven to two. 8 to 1 King Leonidas and Sabuska, who loves this track, 9 to 1. It was 9s and bigger, the rest of them. And it was Aldari who did uh, the business uh, here in this Balmoral handicap in the style of a, a group horse, I think. We'll highlight where they came from. Now, remember in the sprint, they all came from low draws. Here, there's a bit all over the place where they, they've come from. 11, 15, and 12 and uh, 7 for Nugget, who was back in fourth place. So it's all, it's all a bit of a mishmash here, really. I thought that it might be low draws that, that were favoured. The favourite was drawn was drawn high, um, but it didn't stop people wanting to support him. And I wondered if low draws would hold sway, but it wasn't. It was just um, a top-class horse that's won this handicap. And why do I think he's so good? Well, I've compared his time with Baid, Baid the winner of the QE2, over this straight mile. Baid was 142.57. This horse is 142.64. Well, it's only you know, 0 0.05 of a second outside what Baid managed to do. So um, the, I think the, the QE2 was run at a, a steadier gallop early on, courtesy of Ben Battle. And we talked about that pace winding up. This is a more honest gallop over a mile. So that's why you've got a times, the times have come close together. I don't think it means that Aldari could possibly beat Baid. I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying that the races were running in a different style. This was, was quite strongly run. Aldari, although he jumped from sort of the middle of the field, he is over on the far side. He's in the, the Shadwell colours. Just pick him up for you. There he is. He's got himself over there uh, and he shows a bright turn of foot to go uh, and win this from uh, Symbolise in second place. Uh, and I do think that he has to be a group horse, given that he's won this off a mark of 109. That's some performance, really. It really is. This race won by a good horse last year, Njord. He's a group horse uh, now, I think. Uh, so this is a, a really big effort from Al Dari. Uh, the favourite, while well, he was most disappointing, he's here, middle of the track. About there he is, under Frankie de Tori. He'd been in here somewhere and in this group, and Frankie had switched across, perhaps thinking that he was in the wrong group and he wanted to get across with those on the far side, but that didn't work for him. There'll be another day for him, I think, on what he did at Chelmsford last time. He's a very good horse. 
uh, and Aldari. Quickening up here in good style. Symbolised coming up down more down the middle of the tracks. So there wasn't that particular draw bias here, really. Magical morning boxes on for third and uh, Nugget on the far side, rounding out uh, fourth place. So what I would say is that Aldari raced much of the race over on the far side, where all the action came in the sprint as well. So maybe he was a little bit favoured by position, but he's produced a good time. He's won off a mark of 109. He must be a uh, really good horse and a, a group race prospect going forward to uh, next season. Handicaps will surely be out of the way as far as he's concerned now. And what did this mean? Well, what it meant was it was a fantastic treble for Shadwell and a brilliant treble for Jim Crowley as well. Uh, Shadwell, who are reducing the size of their, their operation, both in terms of breeding and in terms of horses that they, they have in training. Well, wow, they've got a fantastic treble here on Kipco British uh, Champions Day. And uh, the nice horses are going forward to this horse and uh, Ashada. Well, they're both going to make waves next season, uh, one would have uh, thought. And there's a brilliant day for Jim Crowley as well. Superb stuff. So how do we sum up? Um, what we saw here. Very good time, 142.64 compared to Baid, 142.57. Baid, I said when we analysed that race, could have gone faster. Yes, he could, but the race was steadily run early on. Aldari's got to be a group horse. I, I'm, I'm absolutely adamant about this. Given the time he produced and winning off a very strong handicap of a mark of 109, the only thing uh, we would say is that soft ground might always be important to Aldari going forward. All five wins have come with cut in the ground. So that's an important thing to note next season. Absolutely brilliant for Shadwell. Superb for them. Many congratulations to them and to their operation. Jim Crowley as well, a treble and a brilliant double uh, for William Haggis, who had a great day. Now, I just don't think this horse is a, a one to be giving up on. Sunray Major. He was the well-backed favourite, so they couldn't get enough of him in the market. He went with too much zest. He was a bit keen. He changed position from one group to another. Um, things didn't pan out, but he's not a horse to give up on. He produced a fantastic time form speed figure, a big one when he won at Chelmsford last time up. He's well ahead of his handicap mark. He's a horse very much uh, to keep an eye on. But as far as Kipco uh, British Champions Day was concerned, that was the man of the moment, really, Jim Crowley with his superb treble and the performance of the day definitely came from Baid. He remains unbeaten. He is six from six, and he was quite simply the best horse that we saw on Saturday amongst an array of stars.